Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Dr. Nirav Padlia. Uh, I'm Vice President of Research at Myos Rens Technology, a medical nutrition company based in uh, Cedar Knolls, New Jersey. And I'm uh, very delighted to be joining you uh, this evening uh, to talk with you about a new product called Body, Body Logic MD Muscle Formula. And so uh, the way that I've uh, divided this webinar is uh, I'm going to spend about the first half of the webinar uh, talking in general about the importance of muscle health. And I'll, I'll be talking about a number of important human clinical trials that have been conducted that are relevant to this discussion. And then uh, I'm going to spend the, the remaining half of the webinar talking specifically about this product uh, that, that we have private labeled uh, developed for body logic called body logic MD muscle formula. So I guess the, the first question is, um, is why does muscle health matter, right? And uh, muscle health is, is important uh, to, to the patients that come to, to visit your clinics uh, for a number of reasons. I would say that the number one reason is longevity. And, uh, and so I'm going to talk about two very important studies that were done, one at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, and another study that was done at Harvard Medical School that focused specifically on uh, muscle mass and, uh, and breast cancer survival to, to illustrate this point. Then I'm going to talk about uh, you know, quality of life uh, briefly to, to some degree. So, you know, think about all of the things that, that you enjoy doing uh, on the weekend, for example, things like going golfing, uh, playing tennis, dancing, or biking, you know, all, all of these activities, I'm sure you can appreciate, they all depend on, on, on essentially on having good muscle health. Now, uh, muscle, muscle health and bone health go, go together hand in hand. And so this paper by Hamrick uh, discusses, it's an excellent paper that discusses the biochemical crosstalk that takes place between muscle and bone. So for example, muscle uh, produces important uh, growth factors and cytokines. Some examples of these include uh, IGF-1 and fibroblast growth factor two, which are important for, uh, very important for bone health. And along with that, there is extensive uh, biomechanical interactions that take place in, uh, between muscle and bone. So muscle exerts uh, mechanical loading forces against bone, uh, for example, and, and those mechanical loading forces, they help uh, maintain the, the shape, the form, and the density of bone, uh, for example. Uh, as all of you know, uh, muscle plays a vital role in, in glucose metabolism, and so it's not surprising that reduced muscle mass is correlated with elevated risk for type 2 diabetes, and uh, that is discussed in this paper by Landy uh, et al. Uh, and, you know, muscle mass uh, is very important in terms of uh, avoiding injury as, you know, as, as people grow, grow older. Uh, as you all know, muscle plays a vital role in, in our system of balance. And so as muscle mass is compromised uh, and as balance is compromised, the odds of suffering a fall or fall-related injury greatly increase. And, and that is discussed in this uh, reference uh, by Landy as well. So the first study that I want to talk about is the study that uh, was done at the Karolinska Institute. It looked at the correlation between muscular strength and mortality in men. Uh, I, I like this study a lot because it was a large study, 8,762 men between 20 to 80 years of age. And it sought to examine the association between muscular strength and mortality from all causes, including cardiovascular disease and cancer in, in these men. Uh, it was done at an aerobic center, a, a longitudinal study, the aerobic center was Cooper Clinic in Dallas, Texas. And the other thing I like about this study is that there was a very long follow-up period, a period of about 18.9 years on average. So I know that there is a lot of data displayed on this table, but I'd really like you to just focus your attention on the area that I've highlighted in this uh, red box. And so if we look at uh, all-cause mortality, and if we look at men that were in the lower third in terms of muscular strength, 
and compare them with their peers that were in the middle and in the upper thirds, we see that the adjusted mortality rate was approximately 50% higher in, in men that were in the bottom one third in terms of muscular strength. And now if we look at mortalities due to cardiovascular disease, we can see that the rate of mortality was about twice as high in, in the group of men that, uh, that were in the lower one third in terms of muscular strength when compared with their peers in the middle and in the upper one third. And then when we do a comparison for cancer-related mortality, we again, we, we see a trend here, which is comparable to the all-cause mortality trend where uh, men in the lower one-third had a mortality rate that was about 50% higher relative to their peers that were in the middle and upper, uh, upper thirds. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, we can all, we can all relate that, that over the last two months, it's been very difficult for us to, to focus on anything uh, other than COVID-19, right? I mean, it, it, it seems like COVID-19 has really dominated almost every aspect of our lives. And, uh, and so I, I believe that the subject of muscle health is, is very relevant uh, to the discussion of, uh, of COVID-19. And so uh, I, I will explain in, in, this, uh, in this slide and in the slides that I will present uh, that, that follow this slide. So this is a slide from uh, a preprint, uh, which was uh, back in February of 2020, which uh, although it was only three months ago, it, it seems like it was a lifetime ago. And this is looking at uh, case fatality rates uh, as far as COVID-19 goes from, from data from Hubei province in China. And one of the things that's very interesting is that if we, if we look at the COVID-19 case fatality ratio, you know, it's very low for, for people who are relatively young, even for people who are ages 50 to 59, the case fatality rate, according to this data, is 1.3%. But when we look at people above the age of 60, uh, the case fatality rate increases uh, substantially. And you know, in people who are uh, 80 plus, the, the CFR rate was, uh, was 18%. And likewise, if we look at this data set, uh, which was from March 17th, uh, which looks at COVID-19 deaths in Italy, Again, we see that the vast majority of deaths, they, they occurred in people that were over the age of 70. And so although it's too early right now and we don't have any data that correlates um, muscular strength with COVID-19 related mortality, you know, looking at the data from the Karolinska study, we can see that you know, when we look at mortality from all causes, people with lower muscular strength have higher rates of mortality. And so it's my hypothesis that, that many of these, the, these people, uh, m many of these fatalities, when we look at COVID-19 fatalities, uh, the fatality rate was, was likely, uh, and again, it's hypothesis, was, was likely higher in people with lower muscular strength. So, you know, if we look at uh, influenza data, we can see here that the flu results in, the, the, the common flu results in almost half a million hospitalizations in the United States. The, the, this is CDC data. And uh, out of uh, CDC data from last year's uh, flu season, and out of these hospitalizations, you know, 279,000 of these hospitalizations involve patients uh, 65 years of age and older. And if we look at fatalities from the flu, uh, approximately 75% of the flu-related fatalities happened in, in patients above the age of 60, 65. And so again, you know, it, it's CDC data. I, I, don't have any, uh, I, I don't have any data on muscular strength and that, that correlates muscular strength with this data set, but it's my hypothesis that, you know, the people who are most adversely impacted were likely people with lower muscular strength. Right, and, uh, and that's probably why, you know, with, with lower muscular strength, they, they likely cannot uh, handle the flu as well as people who, who are 
uh, much younger relative to them and, and who are much stronger in comparison. So um, in the uh, April 8th issue of uh, Science Magazine, uh, there, there was some discussion about COVID-19 related muscle atrophy by uh, Professor Dale Needham uh, at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, you know, according to Dr. Needham, he wrote that uh, those who survive a long period on a ventilator are prone to muscle atrophy and weakness. Keeping a critically ill patient moving, raising their arms and legs, and eventually helping them sit up, stand, and walk can reduce that weakness and get them off the ventilator faster. But because SARS-CoV-2 is so infectious, bringing rehab specialists into patients' room, uh, rooms can be, can be a challenge. And so this, this illustrates the, the fact that, you know, it, it's clear that uh, COVID-19 has caused you know, many patients to lose a lot of muscle mass. And based on what we know from the Karolinska study, when people lose muscle mass, the odds of, of mortality increase uh, significantly. And so it's very important for these patients as they recover to work on trying to regain the muscle mass that they had lost. So one of the studies that I believe is, is very important that, that relates to our uh, discussion of COVID-19 and muscle health uh, is a study on sarcopenia and ICU survival, uh, which, which focused specifically on ventilator weaning. And this was a study, it was done in uh, Taiwan. It was published last year at Liku uh, Changgung Memorial Hospital. And uh, the researchers, they were interested in the question you know, how does sarcopenia impair the respiratory musculature and uh, how does that influence the outcome of ventilator weaning? And so this was a, a study that involved 96 patients in the surgical ICU that uh, were undergoing mechanical ventilation. And what, what the researchers found is when they looked at sarcopenia, uh, in this particular case, and they looked at patients that were difficult to wean, the presence of sarcopenia led to an odds ratio of 4.767. And when we looked at uh, the presence of sarcopenia and we, we focused our attention on ICU mortality, the odds ratio was greater than five in, in this case. So it shows that the presence of, uh, of sarcopenia uh, is a significant risk factor for these ICU patients when it comes to becoming difficult to wean and when it comes to mortality in the ICU. Uh, another study that I'd like to talk about is a study that, uh, that, that took place at uh, Tamana Regional uh, Health Medical Center in uh, Kumamoto, Japan. And so I, I want to talk about this study, which focused on sarcopenia and aspiration pneumonia survival in older adults. Because as you know, uh, one of the complications of COVID-19 is that it, it, it sometimes does uh, result in, uh, in, in pneumonia. And so this was a prospective observational cohort study uh, in an acute geriatric hospital uh, to look at the impact of sarcopenia on 90-day mortality following aspiration pneumonia. And uh, it involved 151 subjects, um, uh, 151 subjects, their, their average age was approximately 85 years of age. And uh, in this particular study, uh, the appendicular skeletal muscle, ma uh, muscle index was measured using bioelectrical impedance analysis. And uh, aspiration pneumonia was diagnosed based on, on the three criteria listed below. And so as we can see here, if we, if we look at the solid line, the solid line corresponds to probability of survival with uh, time on the, the x-axis. And this is for patients who are in the, the top 75% of the population uh, in terms of ASMI uh, measurements, which were, which were based on bioelectrical impedance analysis. And if we looked at, at this dashed line below it, this dashed line represents the weakest, the lowest in terms of ASMI, 
uh, the bottom 25%. And we can see that 90 day survival was much lower uh, in sarcopenic patients who are in the bottom 25% of, of ASMI relative to their peers who are in the top 75%. And so now I would uh, uh, get getting away from the subject of, uh, of COVID-19, I would like to talk about uh, breast cancer survival and, and how sarcopenia impacts breast cancer survival. Um, so this was a study that uh, was published a couple of years ago. It uh, was done by researchers at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. It looked at women with non-metastatic breast cancer and the, the researchers asked the question, are sarcopenia, poor muscle quality, and uh, an excess adiposity at diagnosis associated with overall mortality in patients with non-metastatic breast cancer? And so it was an observational study involving 3,241 women with non-metastatic breast cancer. And so uh, CT was performed at the, the time of diagnosis. And based on CT, the women were placed in, in different buckets, one of them being sarcopenia, uh, another being poor muscle quality, and another being excess adiposity. And the main outcome measures of this study were overall survival time and all-cause mortality. So uh, once again, I, I realized that uh, you know, this is a lot of data that I'm showing you here, but I'd really like you to just focus on this box that I've highlighted in red. And if we look at the women who were non-sarcopenic and had low total adipose tissue and use them as our reference and compare them with, with their counterparts who were sarcopenic and also had low total adipose tissue, we can see that the hazard ratio increased from 1 to 1.35. And then when we look at women who are non-sarcopenic, but were in the middle in terms of total adipose tissue, uh, the hazard ratio increased from 1.28 to 1.83 when we compared these women with women which were also in the middle in terms of total adipose tissue, but were sarcopenic. And finally, when we compared non-sarcopenic women with high total adipose tissue, with sarcopenic women with high total adipose tissue, we can see that the um, hazard ratio increased from 1.45 to 2.05. And when we look at the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right-hand side, we can see there is a clear difference in survival between sarcopenic women uh, relative to non-sarcopenic women, uh, as you can see here. And so now I'd like to talk briefly about, uh, about frailty. And so the the clinical definition of frailty, according to this paper that was published some time ago in the Journal of uh, Gerontology, is when there is the presence of three or more of these components, uh, shrinking, you know, weight, weight loss, unintended weight loss, typically about 5% over a 12-month period, uh, weakness, you know, uh, often this is, uh, is self-reported, uh, typically it, it can often be measured by grip strength, Poor endurance and energy is often self-reported. Slowness, uh, as you could appreciate, would typically be measured by, by gait speed, which is easy to do these days with, with, with smart watches. And, and finally, low physical activity level. So the presence of three uh, out, of, out of these five typically uh, fits the clinical definition of frailty. So why, why is, uh, is sarcopenia so de important to the discussion of frailty? Well, according to Professor Morley at St. Louis University, a key opinion leader in, in this field, uh, it has been suggested that sarcopenia is the major cause of frailty. So, you know, uh, how have we at, at, uh, at Myos, uh, and working with uh, your team at Body Logic MD, how have we addressed sarcopenia and frailty? We have addressed it uh, through an advanced nutrition product called Fortitropin. And, uh, and so Fortitropin is uh, one of the key ingredients in Body Logic MD muscle formula. And so what is fortitropin? It's a, it's a natural bioactive composition made from fertilized chicken egg yolk. 
Uh, this is produced using a patented manufacturing process that uh, leverages high pressure pasteurization and, uh, technology and freeze drying. So it's a low temperature manufacturing process developed by researchers at the German Institute of Food Technologies and that helps to retain the uh, activity of the biomolecules being the peptides, proteins and lipids that are found to be naturally present in fertilized chicken egg yolk. Uh, it has been shown in clinical studies to increase uh, muscle mass and strength, to prevent atrophy and to improve recovery. Uh, Fortitropin is manufactured in, uh, in modern state-of-the-art uh, GMP facilities in Germany. And uh, our company has uh, two issued US patents uh, that relate to the manufacturing process of Fortitropin. Uh, one of the questions that I'm sure you will be asked by, by many of your patients uh, has, to, has to do with egg intake, uh, cardiovascular disease risk, and mortality. So I would like to bring this paper to your attention. It was published back in January of this year. Uh, it was one of the largest studies to date that has been done on uh, egg intake as it involved 177,000 people in 50 countries. And as you can see from here, the authors of this study concluded that they did not find significant associations between egg intake, uh, blood lipids, mortality, or major CVD events. So the product that we have, uh, have developed uh, for BodyLogic MD is uh, it's called BodyLogic MD Muscle Formula. It's a, a revolutionary all natural product that is backed by rigorous clinical research. Uh, it's, it's comprised of simple ingredients, uh, being fortitropin, branched-chain amino acids, uh, creatine, monk fruit, and natural vanilla flavor. And it's mo uh, manufactured in modern state-of-the-art uh, GMP facilities, as you can see. So um, one of the, uh, the key studies that I'd like to talk about uh, involving fortitropin was a study that we sponsored at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, this was a study that was done in the laboratory of Professor William uh, J. Evans. Uh, Professor Evans is one of the key opinion leaders in the sarcopenia field with approximately 250 publications to his credit. And in this study, the, uh, the researchers, they wanted to look at the impact of fortitropin on the rate of muscle protein synthesis after 21 days of intervention. And so the study involved 20 subjects, 10 men and, and 10 women, uh, between 60 to 75 years of age. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled uh, clinical trial. So 10 subjects received fortitropin and 10 subjects received placebo, which in this case was cheese powder. And so the idea is that the subjects, they had to consume deuterium oxide every day, uh, a heavy water tracer. And so some of the, the deuterons from the deuterium oxide uh, eventually got incorporated into all of the amino acids uh, that, are, that are synthesized throughout the body. And so uh, the, the idea is that when a, after 21 days, the subjects had to go for a muscle microbiopsy and proteins were extracted from that muscle, uh, from that tissue sample, muscle tissue sample. Those proteins were digested with trypsin and those peptides were analyzed using high resolution mass spectrometry. And uh, because everybody had to consume this tracer, uh, the, using high resolution mass spectrometry, it's possible to measure the, the rate, the, uh, the incorporation of deuterium very accurately. And so based on how much deuterium was measured in these tissue samples, it was then possible to calculate the impact on the rate of muscle protein synthesis. And so this workflow was used as a basis to examine the impact that fortitropin had on the rate of muscle protein synthesis. And so the, this is a schematic uh, examining some of the classes of proteins that were identified using high resolution mass spectrometry. Uh, this work was presented a couple of months ago at the International Conference on Frailty and Sarcopenia Research that took place in Toulouse, France, and it, it has now been submitted for publication to the Journal of Gerontology. And uh, 
as you can see from this, so the orange bars correspond to uh, the fractional synthesis rate for, for, for fortitropin, while the blue bars correspond to cheese powder. And what we found was that the overall magnitude of the increase in the rate of muscle protein synthesis was about 15% in the fortitropin supplemented group. So another human clinical trial that we did sometime uh, previous to this, uh, this was what was published back in 2016. This was also a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. It took place over the course of 12 weeks and uh, it involved uh, males between 18 to 21 years of age who had to complete uh, monitored and uh, supervised resistance training twice per week. And they had to work closely with a, with a dietitian to, to monitor and control their diet. So this study involved 45 males that were randomized in three arms. Uh, one arm was a placebo arm. The other arm was a 6.6 .6 gram per day dose of fortitropin arm, and the other arm was a triple dose of fortitropin per day. And as you can see here, uh, if we look at lean body mass in the placebo group and muscle thickness, there, there was not really a statistically significant increase in these two parameters in the placebo group, but we did see st statistically significant increases in lean body mass and muscle thickness in both of the two active groups. And so in terms of lean body mass, the subjects that consume fortitropin, they gained on average uh, 1.7 and 1.8 kilograms of lean body mass respectively versus 0.6 kilograms of lean body mass uh, in the placebo group. And, uh, and so this work was published in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition in 2016. So recently, uh, we, we also, uh, we sponsored a preclinical study at Kansas State University that looked at the impact of fortitropin on, uh, in, in dogs while dogs are recovering from a, a surgical procedure called TPLO, tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. Uh, since then, this work has now been published in the journal PLOS One. It, it's now available on the PLOS One website if you do a search for, for fortitropin or, or the author's name. Uh, so, so this is a, a surgical procedure that is performed to repair tears of the cranial cruciate ligament in dogs, which is analogous to the, the ACL in humans. And so the idea is that 50 dogs receive fortitropin on a daily basis, and 50 dogs received a macronutrient match placebo, uh, which in this case was cheese powder. The dogs had to come in for regular evaluations at, uh, at baseline uh, eight weeks after surgery and 12 weeks, where parameters such as thigh uh, circumference, muscle thickness, stance analysis, and blood chemistry were evaluated. The key takeaways from this were, were, were that pre uh, fortitropin prevented muscle loss and affected and unaffected limbs. Fortitropin supplemented dogs had greater improvement in weight bearing capacity on the operated limb and fortitropin supplementation prevented a rise in levels of myostatin. So this is a table that's taken from the paper which has now been published. But if we look at data for thigh circumference and if we look at the affected and unaffected limb in the fortitropin supplemented group, we can see that over eight weeks, there, there is a decrease, okay? There is a decrease of about 0.5 centimeters in thigh circumference. But this decrease is much smaller than the decrease which is seen when we look at the placebo group where we, we see a drop of, of 1.2 centimeters compared to 0.5 centimeters. And when we look at the unaffected limb, uh, when we look at this number here, we go from 36.5 to 35.8. So it's about a 0.7 centimeter drop. But when we compare this decrease here with the uh, placebo supplemented group and look at the unaffected limb, the decrease was almost three times as, as great uh, at two centimeters versus 0.7 centimeters. Now, if we look at weight, weight bearing capacity, so this is measured using something called force plate analysis. So the idea is that the dogs, they have to stand on a force plate 
uh, which consists of four plates. And you know, under normal circumstances, the dog's weight would be evenly distributed. So you know, 25% of its weight on each of the four legs. But after the dog, you know, when the dog is injured right before surgery, they cannot apply a lot of force on, on that limb. And so they can only apply 8% of their weight on the operated limb. But after eight weeks, the fortitropin supplemented dog improved it. It went from 8% to 13.74%. So this is much smaller though than the increase which was seen in the placebo supplemented dog. Uh, when we looked at its affected limb, uh, the increase was, was much more modest. And so uh, it, it was about 3.25%. So if, if we look at these two increases, we see that the increase, the, the recovery was 40% uh, greater roughly in the fortitropin supplemented group relative to the placebo supplemented group. And this work has now been published as I, as I mentioned earlier in PLOS One. So we were very excited about the data from that, uh, that, that preclinical study that we did at Kansas State University. And so based on that uh, uh, positive outcome, we decided to initiate another human clinical trial. We began patient recruitment in January of this year. And we're working with Professor Stuart Phillips at McMaster University, uh, like Professor Evans. Professor Phillips is a, is a key opinion leader in the field with more than uh, about 220 publications to his credit. And so this study that we're doing, this human clinical trial, involves a model known as the unilateral leg immobilization model. Essentially, the participants, they have to wear a cast on their knee for a period of two weeks. And wearing that cast induces muscle atrophy. And so what we want to, to find out is, is can fortitropin reduce muscle disuse atrophy uh, relative to placebo? So the, the design of the study is randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. Uh, there, there are two groups, you know, 12 subjects. 12 of these men are going to receive cheese powder, and 12 men are going to receive fortitropin. And, uh, and the idea is that there's going to be a two-week run-in period where the subjects will consume their assigned supplement for two weeks. Then there will be a two-week period of immobilization where subjects will continue to take their assigned supplement, but they will, they will begin to wear their, their, the cast on their knee as shown over here. And then after week four, they will remove the cast and continue with their assigned supplement for a two week uh, recovery period. And there are going to be a number of measurements that will be taken throughout, such as muscle microbiopsies, uh, DEXA, uh, ultrasound, uh, my myostatin measurements, for example. So what, one of the things which is unique about the BodyLogic MD uh, muscle formula product is in addition to uh, containing fortitropin, this product is also supplemented with creatine and branched chain amino acids. So I thought it would be you know, useful to talk about one study uh, that was done on creatine supplementation, uh, focusing on older adults. You know, this was a study that was done in Brazil uh, it involved 32 subjects. Uh, 16 of these subjects were allocated to the placebo group, which was five grams per day of maltodextrin, while 16 subjects were allocated to the active group, which was creatine. And they, they along with subjects in the placebo group, also had to complete resistance training. Uh, what we can see here is when, when lean mass measurements were made, uh, we saw a, a very significant gain in subjects that, that consumed creatine while performing resistance training uh, in comparison to those that were in the placebo group that uh, while, while they performed resistance training as well, uh, quite a significant uh, improvement as you can see in muscle gain. Uh, so as I had mentioned, uh, along with creatine and fortitropin, BodyLogic MD muscle formula contains branched chain amino acids. And so one, one study that is, uh, that is worthwhile discussing is this study that was done at Kumamoto Rehabilitation Hospital in Japan. Uh, this was an eight week 
multi-center randomized controlled uh, blinded outcome two cohort parallel group intervention trial that focused on older men and women uh, greater than 65 years of age with, with low muscle mass. And these were all patients that were, that were recovering. Uh, some of them were recovering from stroke, some from musculoskeletal disease, and some were recovering from hospital-associated uh, deconditioning. And so these subjects had to uh, undergo some low-intensity resistance training, uh, and, and they were assigned to, uh, to either receive branched-chain amino acids or to, to, to receive a, a, a placebo. And so what we can see here is that uh, when, when we look at the intervention group and when we compare them with the, uh, the, the control group, it's apparent here. The, so th this was done using two different statistical methods, but we can see here that there were improvements uh, in the intervention group, when, when we look at them that are, that are statistically significant, uh, when we look at mean arm circumference, uh, when we look at mean calf circumference, uh, but particularly what's, what's particularly pronounced is in the intervention group, you have real significant improvement uh, in mean hand grip strength in those that receive branched chain amino acids compared to those who, who receive the placebo. So, you know, uh, in this slide, I've, I've summarized uh, three important patient demographics that, uh, you know, I, I would imagine uh, all of you likely see in your practice. Uh, patients who are, who are interested in, you know, sports and, uh, and performance. And so for that particular demographic, the clinical evidence that we have is summarized in this paper that was published in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition. Uh, I'm sure many of you have patients who would fall into the, the category of healthy aging. And so the clinical evidence to support the use of this product, uh, fortitropin, the active ingredient in BodyLogic MD, uh, is supported by this presentation uh, uh, of, the, of these clinical results at the International Conference on Frailty and Sarcopenia Research. And I, as, as I had mentioned earlier, this work has been submitted uh, to the Journal of Gerontology for publication. And in terms of uh, patients who fall in the, the category of recovery and rehabilitation, the evidence for the use of product uh, as it relates to recovery and rehabilitation uh, is supported by this PLOS One manuscript, which has now been published. And along with that, uh, we have initiated a human clinical trial at McMaster University, uh, which was initiated in January of this year, and we, we hope will be complete sometime next year. We have uh, received a number of uh, excellent testimonials uh, related to fortitropin, the, the active ingredient in the product. Many of them are from uh, former football players, uh, such as Carl Nelson, uh, Joe Thomas, uh, we, we have worked with Aaron Gordon, who plays for the Orlando Magic, and, and Carly Lloyd, uh, who is a FIFA World uh, Champion and Olympic gold medalist. And uh, just to summarize, uh, BodyLogic MD Muscle Formula is, uh, is a revolutionary advanced nutrition product that uh, supports muscle health. And uh, I'd like to thank you, thank all of you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me by email at npadlia, N-P-A-D-L-I-Y-A, at myoscorp, M-Y-O-S-C-O-R-P dot com. Uh, take care and, and have a wonderful evening. Uh,